So if you're a triple scientist, you'll need to know about the brain and the eye and the different functions the different structures have. So let's talk about the brain first of all. Now the brain is actually split up into several different components and we're going to focus on each one. So the first one is the cerebrum, otherwise known as the cerebral cortex, and it helps us with our intelligence, our personality, conscious thought, language and memory. We also have another section called the cerebellum, which is like a cabbage shape at the bottom of the brain, and it helps us with balance, coordination and muscular activity. The hypothalamus is a small section of the brain that has a thermoregulatory center. Essentially, it helps us to control and maintain our body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. And it also helps us to maintain our water levels. Now, there are some other hormones involved with osmoregulation, such as ADH, which is released from the pituitary gland. And we'll talk about this later. We also have another section called the medulla oblongata. Now it connects the brain and brainstem to the spinal cord, but its main job as well is to help us with unconscious activities such as heart rate and breathing rate. Now we can actually identify these different parts of the brain and look at their function by using technology such as MRI and EEGs. The eye is another functional organ that we need to know the structure and function of each individual part. So let's talk about some of those key areas now. So there's a white tough outer layer of the eye called the sclera and this protects the eye. We also have the cornea and this controls the diameter and size of the pupil. The pupil itself is just a hole which light enters through and next to it we have the iris and this is the coloured part of the eye and essentially this controls the diameter of the pupil as well. The lens itself is a transparent biconcave structure that actually helps refract the light to the back of the eye called the retina. The retina itself con contains all the light receptors such as uh, rods and cones and these help us to see the way we do. Now I mentioned rods and cones because the fovea, which is a structure at the back of the eye, part of the retina, that's what contains the cone cells. Now the main difference between rods and cones is to do with the amount of light intensity. Rods are specifically useful in low light conditions, whereas cones are better in a more uh, intense light condition. So we've got two different types of cells, which are photoreceptors. They're very um, dependent on the type of light intensity and how well they function. Now at the back of the eye, we also have the optic nerve, which essentially sends this information through uh, electrical impulses to the CNS, the central nervous system. Now to help us to focus, we have two different structures. We have the ciliary muscles that control the shape of the lens, but also suspensory ligaments that attach the ciliary muscles to the lens as well. I'm gonna talk about those now. Now, for the most part, everyone's eyes have this process called accommodation, and this is a process of changing the lens shape to focus on near and distant objects. However, sometimes some people's eyes don't do this as accurately or as well as others, and therefore corrective lenses are needed. So there are two conditions you need to know about, myopia and hyperopia. Myopia is known as short-sightedness, and this is because essentially the, the eyeball itself is elongated um, and the lens is too thick and curved. So what people need are replacement lenses that are concave. And as you can see, the, the uh, light itself will actually be refracted better across to the back of the eye, to the retina. Um, as you can see, the light is actually converging before the retina. So myopia, you'll need a concave lens. Now, the opposite is for myopia, hyperopia, and hyperopia is known as long-sightedness. So people who um, have hyperopia, they will need to have a convex lens, and this is to make that light refraction um, occur at the retina and not past the eyeball. And again, this is because the eyeball is either too short, um, there's also some loss of elasticity in the lens, um, this could be age-related. So if you're a triple scientist, you also need to know about thermoregulation. And as I said, this is monitored by the hypothalamus that has a thermoregulatory center. It has essentially what we call thermoreceptors that are found on our skin and other parts of our body. And this coordinates with the hypothalamus and the brain to maintain that optimal temperature of 37 degrees Celsius in our core body temperature. And this is for homeostatic mechanisms to maintain enzyme action and cellular function. So if the temperature rises above 37 degrees Celsius, our hypothalamus will actually coordinate our body to start sweating to release water that will evaporate off the surface of our skin and how it does that is because of another process called vasodilation our blood vessels such as capillaries will actually expand slightly and rise closer to the surface of the skin which means that heat is actually transferred that thermal energy is transferred to the environment and causing that sweat to evaporate off our skin releasing that energy as it does so now this happens um, when we get too hot, but what happens if we get too cold? So if that body temperature decreases below 37 degrees Celsius, our thermoreceptors detect this and coordinate with the brain, the hypothalamus, to actually cause the opposite approach. So we start to shiver, which essentially is our muscles contracting, our skeletal muscles specifically, and that causes this involuntary shaking, which generates and starts to release some heat from our muscles through respiration. We also have the process of vasoconstriction, which is the opposite to vasodilation. So constriction, vasoconstriction, 
hypertension means the narrowing of our capillaries, our blood vessels. And this helps to prevent any thermal energy being released to the environment. Also, our vellus hairs, the small hairs on the surface of our skin will actually stand up tall or they will have erector muscles which will contract and cause those hairs to stand on end and trap the um, air around us. And that will act as an insulating layer. Now, this entire process of getting back to optimal temperature of 37 degrees Celsius is what we call a negative feedback loop, which is something you could be expected to write about and also to apply to different situations as well. So if you are a triple scientist, you need to know a bit more detail about the kidneys. Not only are they a vital endocrine organ and they have the adrenal glands attached to them and produce adrenaline, they also have a fantastic ability to filter our blood and produce urine which is a waste product and we do not need to, therefore we excrete it. So what happens and how does this work? So in the digestive system process, the small intestine will help break down key components and help with reabsorbing glucose. However, proteins, if we have an excess amount of protein, we can't store it and it has to be broken down into smaller subunits, those monomers called amino acids. And this is done by the process of using an enzyme called protease. Now, those amino acids will be transported to the liver where they quickly are deaminated to form something called ammonia. Now, deamination, like I said, is the process where amino acids are converted into ammonia. But ammonia is an incredibly toxic substance. We don't want it to accumulate in high amounts. And therefore, we need to quickly convert it into a substance that is less toxic called urea. And this urea in excess is um, released from the liver with water, excess ions, and is transported directly into the bloodstream and travels to the kidneys. Now, as I said, the kidneys have the ability to reabsorb key components, but urea is a waste product which we want to eliminate from the body. So it is excreted in the process of producing urine. But let's look at what happens to that water, the excess ions, the urea, everything else, and how this works in the kidneys. So the blood enters the kidney through a vessel called the renal artery, and this is under incredibly high pressure that helps to transport that blood and all the components that are found there to the kidney. Now, there's a really important microscopic structure called the nephron, and there's millions of these nephrons in the kidney, and their function is to help with filtering the blood, but also something called selective reabsorption. So in the first sense, we have something called ultrafiltration of the blood, and essentially what happens is the blood is filtered for things that are very small. So urea, ions, uh, glucose, water, all of these are essentially passed through the filtered mechanism. However, proteins that are found in the blood are much too big and can't get through that filtering stage. So they remain in the blood. However, these are the smaller structures like urea, ions, glucose, water, they pass through the nephron and down to the next stage called the selective reabsorption stage, which is where kind of the magic happens. Now, what happens is depending on how hydrated or dehydrated the individual is will depend on how much water is reabsorbed and how much ions are reabsorbed as well. Also, glucose at this stage is reabsorbed because we need lots of uh, glucose for respiration. Now, depending on, like I said, the hydration levels will depend on how much water is reabsorbed. So this is all dependent on a hormone called ADH, antidiuretic hormone that is released from the pituitary gland. And let's talk about that now. So ADH, if there's less ADH produced, that means less water is reabsorbed. So so the urine is going to be much more dilute and there's going to be more volume. There's going to be a higher amount of urine as well. And this is essentially because the person is already hydrated to an optimal level. However, if someone is very dehydrated, they haven't had enough water, more ADH will occur because what we want to do is maintain the water within the body and not release any. So more water is reabsorbed during this process. And that means the urine produced is less frequent. It's more concentrated in urea. Um, so it'll have a darker color to it and it'll have a smaller volume as well. Now, regardless of either of those situations, the urine that's formed is stored in an organ called the bladder and is released at an appropriate time. Now, if someone's kidneys don't work properly, they can have two methods of medical treatment. So the first one is dialysis, which is a machine that a person is connected to that helps filter their blood. Um, however, this is an incredibly costly process. It, it takes a long time. So the person's well-being is um, reduced because they have to take a lot of their day. It can take several hours, several times a week for years um, until they can find a kidney transplant, which is a second medical treatment. Um, and essentially, there needs to be a specific tissue match for that person. And this can take a long time to find a donor as it's a vital organ it's often um, in the case of accidents where people will be an uh, organ donor so it can take a very long time um, also however it's major surgery so there are risks of infection as well and the person would also need to have immunosuppressant drugs to make sure their body doesn't reject that organ as it is not theirs and it's classed as a foreign object 
So plants have hormones as well, just like humans and other animals. And to start us off, if you're a triple scientist, you need to know about this idea of tropisms. So a tropism is a plant's ability to respond to a stimulus. Now you can have a positive tropism, which means it will move towards a stimulus or a negative tropism, which means it will move away from a stimulus. So there's two types of tropisms you should be aware of at GCC. The first one is phototropism, all to do with light and geotropism, all to do with the earth or gravity and soil. Um, and as you can probably guess, there are shoots and roots to a small growing plant and each of them have different phototropisms for each of those tropisms. So a positive phototropism is found in the shoots however a negative geotropism is also found in the shoots to help it grow upwards and away from the soil. The opposite can be said for the roots so a negative phototropism and a positive geotropism helps the roots grow downwards. Now in the roots and shoots, we have very specialized growing structures. Um, they are not specialized yet, they're stem cells, and this is what we call a meristem. So at these points of a plant, we have a hormone in high concentrations called auxin. Now auxin has an important role in growth and elongation of plant cells. Auxin actually inhibits root growth, but it encourages shoot growth. And this is to encourage that process of photosynthesis that happens in the shoots. Now there's some required practicals you should be expected to understand and interpret. So the first bit of information you should know is that you need to investigate the effects of light or gravity on growing seedlings that have newly been germinated. So in the case of these three plants, you can say A, B and C, we have different conditions and we can see the different effects auxin has on them. So in case A, you can see that the shoots have been chopped at the tip, so there is no auxin and therefore there is no growth. In the case of B, the tips have been covered with a material like a foil, so no light can actually reach that shoot tip. And this means that equal concentrations of the auxin is found on both sides of the plant and therefore they grow evenly. However, in the case of C, in normal everyday plants, if they're just left to their own devices, you can see that one side will receive more light than the other. And the elongated section is where there is an increased level of auxin on the shaded side. And this is to help with that curvature so the plant can actually move towards the light. Now, there are other plant hormones to be aware of. We have gibberellins, which help to end seed dormancy and promote flowering and also increase fruit size. We have ethene, which is used to help fruit ripen. And we also, like I said, have auxin. They can be used in weed killers. They can be used as rooting powders to help encourage growth and in tissue culture to, again, help uh, substances to grow. Tissue culture is actually an example of cloning, which we'll talk about later. If you're a triple scientist, you need to know about cloning. There are two types of cloning in animals. The first simplest version is called embryo transplant, where two individuals of the same species, the egg and sperm cell is released and removed from them and fused together. This is kind of the same as IVF and an embryo will develop. And at this point, the embryo is actually split up into smaller sections before specialization occurs. And they are implanted into individual surrogate mothers. Each of those will produce an offspring, which is identical to each of the other offsprings as well. So they are all identical clones of one another with the desired characteristics from the parents. They are not clones of the parents, however. Another method is adult cell cloning. And this was particularly useful in producing an exact copy of the parent or the parent cells. And this happened in 1996, adult cell cloning in the case of Dolly the sheep. This was the uh, first successful full organism uh, clone. Um, what happens is you have a desired individual with the characteristics that you're looking for, such as a sheep. A cell is removed from their body, so it is a diploid cell, contains all the information of that organism, the entire genome. That nucleus is removed and placed into an empty egg cell of another uh, organism of the same species. And essentially, an electric shock will stimulate the growth of this cell and cause this cell to develop into an embryo. And this is implanted into a surrogate mother to help form that individual. And the offspring produced will be a genetic identical clone of the uh, organism whose nucleus you removed, not the one whose egg cell you removed. Um, and this can also be done in plants as well. So cloning has been done for millennia in plants by using cuttings of the plant where you just cut a small section of the plant, remove the bottom leaves and use um, certain hormones like auxin to encourage uh, cellular growth. We also have tissue culture, again, where small sections of meristems are released from the plant, placed on an agar gel full of nutrients, including auxin to encourage growth and glucose, again, to encourage respiration and growth. And then these small plants, these um, plantlets that are produced from the explant are placed into the soil to help grow those plants. Now, this is much more expensive, more time consuming than cuttings, and therefore is only done to protect uh, rare species. 
So if you're a triple scientist, you need to know about decay. And there are some factors that can increase the rate of decomposition. So temperature, water or moisture and oxygen can increase the rate at which decay occurs to plant and animal tissue. And there are some helpful uh, organisms called decomposers. So bacteria and fungi and worms are all examples of decomposers that help to break down those substances. Now, sometimes these organisms can actually work without oxygen. So anaerobic decay is what we use in the process of biogas generators. And the products of anaerobic decay are methane and carbon dioxide, both are greenhouse gases. But when we burn that animal and crop waste, it actually helps us to generate the fuel that we need. That energy um, that's released can be really helpful. However, like I say, carbon dioxide and methane are produced, so it's not ideal as they can lead to greenhouse effects. We also know that <clears throat> decay and decomposition occurs um, in compost heaps. And this is because there's a lot of aerated soil here. So there's a lot of warmth as well. And this can encourage the decomposition process. Now, you should be expected to know about the required practical. So the aim of it is to investigate the effects of temperature on the rate of decay of fresh milk by measuring the pH change. And essentially, what happens with milk over time is bacteria will decay the milk to form uh, lactic acid from lactose, which is a sugar that the bacteria utilize and feed on. And that lactic acid is an acid. It has a sour taste. Some people will identify it with the scent as well. Um, and therefore, the pH has been reduced and it's, it's been spoiled. Now, what you're doing is you're placing that milk sample into three test tubes um, and you are going to place it in five degrees Celsius, uh, two, 25 degrees Celsius and 40 degrees Celsius water bath. The temperatures can vary. It doesn't matter too much. Um, and you're going to leave it for 24 hours, 48 hours and 72 hours. And as you can imagine, it's not a great site. But here we are. You can test to see how quickly decay has occurred um, by measuring the pH. You can use litmus paper, universal indicator, pH probes. pH probes is more accurate because um, you're going to get a quantitative method. Or result, I should say. And the variables, don't forget SID SAM, so control variables is something that you can keep the same. Um, independent variable is something you're going to alter, and dependent variable is something you're going to measure. So if you're a triple scientist, you need to know about food security. The factors that can affect how much food available we have are things like pests, the population growth, the cost, farming techniques, wars, transportation, and also changes to people's diets and what they want to eat and the supply and demand. Intensive farming um, optimizes the land used and essentially can control the environment those animals are in. Um, so we can give them antibiotics to prevent diseases and stop them getting ill. We can make sure the temperature is optimal so they will grow. We can reduce and limit the amount of walking and running they do so they have a larger muscle mass and therefore they have a higher yield of meat um, but obviously there are some animal welfare concerns with this type of farming organic is slightly different because obviously you can increase the space these animals will have it's the same with uh, crops and uh, plants because we can do something called soil rotation or crop rotation to encourage nutrients in the soil to stop the depletion of those nutrients another way we can actually help with food security is what we call sustainable fisheries and this is to prevent overfishing and have a fishing quota in only selected areas larger nets are used with larger holes so smaller fish can actually reproduce and not be caught too early um, and biotechnology is another technology we are using to help with food security. So the fungus um, fuscarium is used to make a mycoprotein and this is produced in fermenters. Essentially this fungus will produce a protein um, in sterilized conditions at a certain pH and temperature to help that encouraged growth of the mycoprotein. And this is through a process of aerobic uh, fermentation when glucose is added. So fermentation is a type of respiration, but it's aerobic in this case. Um, and it's really beneficial because livestock aren't used, there's less animal welfare, and we can actually increase the number of yield that we produce because it is a fungus that is used as well. And that's it from me. I've been the GCSE science teacher and you have been curious. If you did enjoy this video, give it a big thumbs up. Let me know. Share it with someone else so they don't miss out on key revision. And please do subscribe so you don't miss out on key revision too. Thank you so much for your time. Good luck for your exams. Catch you in the next one.